With no further ado, uh, it's time to introduce our speakers for today's event. And this is also very interesting. It's the first time that we have two speakers, so we get double the fun here today. So I want to start by introducing Shannon Music. She is the director, uh, executive director of Viva Idea, which is a think action tank that contributes to solving key sustainability issues in Latin America. Um, they do that through research, capacity building, and knowledge management. She's also on the board of directors of Viva Trust, FIFCO, and also Lincoln School, where she chairs the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Committee. She was the interim COO for the Social Progress Imperative, where she helped develop the methodology for measuring social and environmental progress around the world. And prior to that, she worked as a consultant for the Boston Consulting Group and was the program manager at New Sector Alliance. She has an MBA, an MPA, and also a psychology degree, psychology degree from Harvard University. Our other speaker is Daniel Carranza. He is the founder of treeseed.org, which is a digital marketing agency for nonprofit organizations. He has launched several successful and not so successful startups, but he's passionate about spreading entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial thinking. He has experience teaching entrepreneurial thought and action to students and teachers, and he has helped lead the effort to implement this methodology at Lincoln School. Uh, he believes that we need to future-proof our learning with the best tool for an uncertain future, which is entrepreneurial thinking. Danielle has an MBA in entrepreneurship from Babson College. So without further ado, let's welcome our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are very excited to be here speaking with you today. We will be alternating, so we'll be talking about different parts of the presentation, as you'll see. And the idea is for us to have a very open conversation. So if you have any questions at any point, interrupt. And we'll also leave some time at the end of each block for additional questions and some more interaction. But feel free to really just ask us anything. This is a topic, uh, as you could see from our intros, that's really core to us. It's very close to our heart. Um, in my case, I think about this all the time with my children. I have three kids. And we think about this all the time. How do we best prepare them for the future? And it's not the same way that we were prepared. So what does that look like? And then uh, at a professional, in a professional setting, I work with entrepreneurs all the time, social entrepreneurs that are actually looking to solve social and environmental problems. They have to be very creative. They're immersed in very difficult situations. And so how do we prepare our students to be able to do that sort of thing later on? So we hope that with this talk, you'll be able to apply this to your own personal experiences, as well as in the classroom or with your kids or, or whatnot. You can tell us afterwards what's most uh, applicable for you. Is it there we go? Okay. So let's get started. The other, other button? This one? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's imagine that it's the year 2030. So it's only 11 years from now. It's not that, that far from now. But I would like you to imagine what your jobs will be like. Where will you be? Will you be, still be doing the same thing? What about the young, younger people that we work with? Where will they be? When you think about that, I hope that you include images like these in your vision for the future. Because this is, this is actually happening already, but it's going to become more and more pervasive. Because technology is everywhere. It's impacting everything that we do, all areas of our lives, and it's increasing at a, an exponential rate, much faster than anything we've seen before. Um, we're in what's called the fourth industrial revolution, and we've never seen the, ex the accelerated changes that happen with the technology that we're seeing today. One of the topics that causes more anxiety when we talk about the fourth uh, industrial revolution is that of how technology will lead to the automation of processes and activities and the possible displacement of the people that actually perform those activities nowadays. There is a study, a McKinsey study, that says that in 2030, one in six of us could lose our job to automation. This study estimates that by 2030, up to 800 million jobs around the world 
could be lost to the automation caused only by technologies that have already been tested today. And we have examples everywhere of how this actually works. We've seen displacement happening in factories. We see it in restaurants. We see it in airports, in banks. It's really part of our, of our everyday lives, but it's hard for us sometimes to really understand how quickly these changes happen and that they can actually affect us. Now, undoubtedly, and actually, um, one out of, uh, six out of 10 professions, this is also from the McKinsey study, six out of 10 professions, at least one third of their activities are already automatable. So it is something that's actually impacting all of us. Now undoubtedly, these advances in technology have great, they bring great things with them and we need those uh, better efficiency to boost the world economy. We're actually counting on these technologies to help solve some of our environmental problems that we're facing. So we need these advances and we, that's a good thing. Um, there are several studies that say that these new technologies will create more new jobs than the ones that they will displace. So there's a lot of good news in there. But the problem is that they're not the same kinds of jobs. And we're not going to need the same kinds of skills to be able to take advantage of them. So in order to continue adding value to our economy, we must focus on strengthening those skills that are less automatable, while also learning to work with technology and taking advantage of technology to strengthen everything that we do. That same McKinsey study says that skills like creativity and understanding emotion are fundamental to the human experience and they are also difficult to automate. And this is very good news because it means that in the future we could have more and more um, greater amount of significant work where the technology takes care of those uh, processes that are more routine and more repetitive and then we can focus on the things that require emotion, require connection with other people. So financial advisors, for example, could spend less time analyzing the data and more time working with their uh, clients to explain creative solutions that they've come up with. So I want us to pause here for a moment and we're gonna do a little experiment with all of you guys. Can you please raise your hand, those of you that think you are creative, can you please raise your hand? Okay, that's pretty good. That's about half of you. That's actually better, better than we've seen uh, in other cases. So what, we, what I want you to do now, you all have a pencil, a number two pencil and a piece of paper, and if you don't have one, there's, there's some right back there. What I would like us to do is take one and a half minutes to write down all the uses that you can think of for that number two pencil that you are holding, right? So I'll tell you when the time is done, just write all the uses that you can think of for that number two pencil. All right, pencils down. <laughs> all right, how many different uses did you come up with? You can just shout it out. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, <laughs> Great. Other uses? Great. Holding your hair, pick up sticks game. Other uses? Bookmark? Writing? Yes. <laughs> Exercise. <laughs> a reacher, excellent. Steak for tomato. What was that? Staple jam tool. Staple jam tool? Ah, yes, great. Wonderful. So let's take one more minute uh, to add more ideas to your list. All right? One more minute. Let's see what else you can come up with. Five more seconds. All right. Okay, how many ideas do you have now? How long is your list now? 11? 16? 
18, 22, excellent. And what are other, other ideas you came up with? Orchestra, conductor, baton. Great, <laughs> I love that. Uh -huh. Massager, great. Other ideas? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. As a ruler, yes. What? For sculpting. For sculpting. Excellent. So this is great. I love, I love hearing this because it turns out you guys are all incredibly creative. So I, you know, everybody knows a pencil is only used for writing. So it's incredible that you've come up with 22, 18, 11 different things that you can do with a pencil. Um, and yes, it means that you step out of your comfort zone a little bit to, you know, it's not the normal thing that you're always doing. Uh, it helps when you share ideas. So we don't, we don't think of it as stealing ideas. It's actually part of the creative process is to share those ideas and build on those. So it's actually completely okay to build on others' ideas and it's part of that process. But this is, you know, when you think about this creativity, all of us were born with an incredible innate ability to be creative. And all you have to do is look at kids, at babies. Um, they are still in a world that's mysterious to them. They're still learning and they learn everything through trial and error. And this is uh, complete, it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're not bound by what's right or what we're supposed to do. It's all a process where they go out and they explore their world. And this is um, what we were all born with. Now, the problem is that as we have grown up, we've been taught in traditional education to seek the right answer. And the constant need to evaluate ourselves has inhibited our creative nature. Today, most of our formal education focuses on developing those logical and analytical skills. And we actually have very little practice using our creativity. In the United States, only 4% of work activities require creativity at a medium level of performance. And in Costa Rica, we have an additional barrier to creativity. And this is how much our society penalizes failure. And of course, with that penalty comes the fear of failure. Fear of failure is the main culprit for curbing creativity and innovation. And this is a huge problem because by definition, innovation and creativity are tied to ambiguous situations where there are unknown results and it de you depend on experimentation and trial and error to evolve and to solve these. These mistakes are the main source of learning. These mistakes or these failures are the main source of learning. And hence the phrase of the founder of Honda that success is 99% failure. In our country, failure is not recognized as a learning opportunity. It is seen rather as something that you try to avoid at all costs. We just have to watch the news, watch your politicians to notice that as a society in Costa Rica, we're more tolerant to people that don't do anything than to those that do things and make mistakes. We have a culture that is generally very risk averse. In terms used by intercultural psychology, we are a country that rates very high in the cultural dimension, um, uncertainty avoidance scoring 86 points out of 100 compared to 46 points for the United States and eight points for Singapore. This is reflected in citizens who resist change, who prefer structure and rules, and they try to control ambiguous situations as much as possible. Our preference for stability is so high that a survey of our secondary students showed that seven out of 10 students aspire to work in the public sector where they hope and they expect to have better conditions and potentially jobs that they could fill for a lifetime. So needless to say, the avoidance of uncertainty and of failure is not compatible with creativity. And quite frankly, it's not feasible in a world that is changing at this exponential speed. So today, we want to propose 
a different approach that promotes creativity and is 100% teachable and learnable. It's developed by Babson University, a world leader in teaching entrepreneurship, and it's called Entrepreneurial Thinking and Action. But I don't mean the ability to start a new company, and we'll be talking about this uh, later on as well. I, I'm speaking about thoughts and actions that help us embrace and face uncertainty instead of avoiding it. It emphasizes intelligent action over planning. We can't keep planning for 20 and 30 years. It highlights fast movement from the blackboard to the real world. Entrepreneurial thought and action is lived in the way that we see things and how we address problems and uncertainty. Now to get a little bit more detailed as to what this actually is and what this looks like, when we teach entrepreneurial thought and action, we seek to develop the skills that you can see here and these competencies. This is the European Entrepreneurship Com Competence Framework or the EntreComp Framework developed by the European Commission. And you'll see here that what we are promoting is that our students are able to spot opportunities, that they're able to be creative, to have a vision or a goal, an overarching goal, to value ideas, and to have ethical and sustainable thinking. We also want our youth to be able to have self-awareness and self-efficacy, to have motivation and perseverance, to be able to mobilize resources, to have financial and economic literacy, and to be able to mobilize others. And when you combine these ideas with resources, you're able to put them into action by learning how to take the initiative, learning about planning and management, how you cope with ambiguity, uncertainty, and risk, how you work with others, and how you learn through experience. Now, if you look at all of these capabilities, all of these competencies, this is what we're used to calling soft skills. But the reality is that these are no longer soft skills. These need to be called the essential skills because this is really what's gonna enable us um, to tackle those problems that we don't even have a question for yet, to collaborate with others to find solutions to problems that have not been solved. And this is what's going to enable our youth to be entrepreneurial and to face that uncertain future, regardless of what it is. So we're gonna go now into the details of what entrepreneurial thought and action actually is and how it all works. So I'll pass this on to Daniel. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Everything good? So this is what entrepreneurial thought and action, this is the definition that Babson College gives it. So it's a method comprising two logics, two ways of thinking, for creating the things that really matter to you. So you really need to understand what really matters to you. Then by taking swift, confident, and smart action. So it's all about taking action in a way that you lower risk. And we're gonna see it in a while. And it's all this when you are faced with the unknown. As Shannon already talked about, the future is quite uncertain. So I truly believe that entrepreneurship is the best tool that you can give a kid that has an uncertain future. For me, this is entrepreneurship. It's solving problems in a creative way. So entrepreneurship is solving problems in a creative way. Every single day that you wake up, we as human beings, we seek to find and solve problems. When you go um, to take a bath, when you talk to your kids, with your wife, with your spouse, you are constantly solving problems. And, and with this definition, anyone can be an entrepreneur. As Shannon said, entrepreneurship is not business creation. You do not have to own a business to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is associated with business because when you go out to the world and you solve a problem in a creative way, you create value. And if you choose to create a Sociedad Anonima and gather that value, you have some profits and you start a business. So entrepreneurship is solving problems in a creative way. I'm gonna explain the two logics that Babson talks about with two examples. First one 
is entrepreneurial thinking. We're going to see the example of using fabrics to create. And then is the managerial thinking, putting together pieces of a puzzle. So first, you have a puzzle, right? It's really well established. It has an end goal. And what do you do when you want to solve a puzzle? What's the first step? Go. So, sorry, the colors, yes, you get the resource, put everything in a table. You start planning the colors, maybe the borders, maybe you set some strategy. You start executing on your plan. It's really easy to measure your progress. And you, once you complete the task, it's done. What's the next process? It's really straightforward. It's a very linear thinking. That's one methodology. Let's talk about building crazy quilts. This is uh, an example that you use fabric to create. So you use the fabric that you have in your house. It, this fabric and all the resources you have depend on who you know. If you go to classes in San, in San Pedro or Santana, if some of your friends do it or, or they don't do it, you have different pieces of fab fabric that you can use to create. It always depends on who you know. The design emerges over time, and every action you take into the quilt expands the possibilities into further things that you can produce. Every output depends on humans taking swift and confident action, stitching a, a new piece, taking a step back and seeing what else you want to add to it. And it's not really tied to a plan. You can plan all you want, but in reality, you depend on the resources and the pieces of fabric that you have in your hand at the time that you start the project. The good thing is that we need both ways of thinking. It's not that one is better than the other one. It's the combination of both, using both as a reflexive uh, muscle and, and, and going to them once you need them. So the, the first one is the puzzle as the prediction logic. It's really st straightforward. It works really well when you can extrapolate data from the past to create a, or, or to know something about the future. It's really deductive logic, really analytical, really mathematical. This is the core logic of virtually all educational institutions. And this is the way of thinking of a large organizations as well. Then we have the other methodology, that's a creation and action. Babson calls it creation logic or entrepreneurial thinking. This is favored by mo almost 90% of serial entrepreneurs. It favors what is real and confirmable over projections and assumptions. It relies on taking smart actions. Action always trumps analysis and planning. It is suitable when you cannot predict the future from the past, as it's going to happen in the years to come, and what the next generations are going to see in the world. And in extreme uncertainty or unknowability, it is the only logical choice. So what we are trying to create in our students is for them to have the tools to go into those two types of mindsets uh, whenever they need them. So I, I'm going to try to explain the entrepreneurial thought and action methodology with um, s steps. It's uh, a three chapter step. And the first one, it's, it starts with idea generation. It always starts with an idea. So the key takeaway of this first chapter is you have to use the resources you have in your hand. Do not wait for anything else. You already have everything you need to take the next step. The first piece of it is for you to understand ideas are important, but you need to understand what's the difference between an idea and an opportunity. The difference is an opportunity is an idea you can take action and create value for yourself or for your community. So for example, there's a concert coming in Estadio Nacional on Saturday, and I have this great idea that I want to put a hot dog stand outside the stadium. It's a great idea, maybe, but it's not an opportunity for me because I cannot leave my work to go put a hot dog stand outside the stadium. So 
we need to understand that we don't have to act upon every single idea that we have, but um, we only take action into the ideas that we want to really create value and to build the things that really matter to us. So I put this here because the people say that the really good ideas are outliers. This is a normal distribution uh, graph, and they said that the outliers, the, these pieces of the, of the tails of the graph, are where the great ideas live. So for me, there is no such thing as when you ask someone, why haven't you started? Many people tell you, I don't have an idea. I don't know what to do. I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Sorry. So for me, there is no such, no such thing as a great idea and a eureka moment. I'm going to be showering and this multi-million dollar idea is going to come into my brain. For me, there is only one way to come up with good ideas. If the ideas live in the outliers of this curve, where do I have more probability to land a good one? If I have five ideas per year or per month, or if I have, I have hundreds of ideas. Obviously, the more ideas you have, the more probability you can to land something that's really extraordinary. So the only real way to come up with good ideas is to come up with lots of ideas. There is a quote, um, I don't remember who told it, but it, he says that ideas are like rabbits. You get a couple and you know how to use them, and once you get the hang of it, they start reproducing. Another step is knowing yourself. Babson states that you want to create the things that really matter to you, so you need to understand what matters to you. What do you value? What do you want to make in this world? Another step is being your biggest fan. Entrepreneurship is a lonely road. It's really, really hard. And if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to be able to make it. So this is a core skill we need to pass to our students. Another core skill is understanding your why. Why you do the things you do. Understand your purpose, understand why you get up in the morning and go to work, and be truthful to yourself. It doesn't matter if you do it uh, for money, to maintain your family, uh, because you like it, because it's something that you believe that the future needs. Be truthful to yourself and understand the real reason of why you do the things you do. Another question is, what do I know? What do I know? more than my classmate, than another teacher, than my students, then who do I know? Who's in my network that can teach me new things, that can present me to another person that I don't know already, that can create value for my project or my business? Very important, start with the means at hand. When we talk about entrepreneurship, about starting something new, about creating, people always have excuses. No, I'm waiting for a co-founder, I'm waiting for money, I'm waiting for time. That's not real. That's only problems that we do and we create in our head. We already have everything we need to start. And another really important thing is to enroll others in your journey. As I told you, it's really lonely and difficult. So the more people you have behind you to do a new project, the easier it is for you not to stop doing what you're doing. So this is a key aspect of it. Enroll other people in and, 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 and make your group, your tribe bigger. The second chapter is building or prototyping. So basically, the key takeaway is action trumps everything else. Action trumps everything. It is the single most important thing when we talk about entrepreneurial thinking, for people to be able to go into the world and take action. What do, we, what do I mean by action? Is It doesn't matter what you want to do, what you want to build in the future, is what you're going to do this week, today, in this minute, right now, with, with what you have in your hand. One of the... Um, of the most powerful tools Babson introduces in entrepreneurial thought and action is the concept of affordable loss. So in affordable loss, you need to understand that you pay 
only what you can afford to lose. Again, paying what you can afford to lose. This is a really key aspect of it because I, I've seen that when people understand their affordable loss, the risk of taking action goes away. And, and it's what incentivizes people to go into the world and, and do the things they do. So, four questions to understand your affordable loss. What is your next step? What is the thing that you need to do to really create value? What do I need to learn? What am I testing? What, what am I missing? What I'm not, am I not seeing? What do I need to ask my customer? What do I need to learn from this next step? Seeing that big step, what is my next action? If, if my step is getting one new customer, my next action cannot be getting a customer. That's too broad. My action needs to be what can I do today? What WhatsApp message I'm gonna send? What email I'm gonna send? Who am I gonna call? And most, this is very powerful, what am I willing to lose to get there? Do you have time? Do you have money? Do you have both? What are you gonna put into this project to make it a reality? There's this very powerful concept about, around minimum viable products. What is an MVP? I, I make this example that I want to show you guys that I, I, I want to take you from point A to point B using an electric car. So if I start with an electric car in my mind, I need to use a lot of resources and time to put a big factory to compete with Tesla and Toyota. So it's gonna take me a really long time and a really steep learning curve of resources to get with my first product of, or my first service out there. So the concept of minimum viable product is for you to distill only the real essence of the test you wanna do and test it out. So if we wanna test getting from point A to point B, maybe we can start with a skateboard and then upgrade it to a scooter and then a bike and move on forward. And maybe during our journey, maybe we're gonna fail and we're, gonna, we're not gonna get to the, to the last piece of it, to the electric car, but maybe we'll build the biggest electric bike company in Latin America. Then there is this concept of low fidelity prototyping that's really powerful for the kids. For you to understand, for example, if you wanna, if you wanna start Nintendo, for example, that there are really valuable lessons from really cheap tests. This is a Nintendo, can you play with it? Si, perfecto. She grabbed the Nintendo like this. So I didn't have to spend a whole of resources and time to understand that if I made all my investments to produce this piece of, so of equipment, of hardware, and I put the joysticks like this, no one's gonna play with it. And I learned that in, with a piece of paper and 20 seconds of a customer's time. So understanding that the big visions we have, we can create really small steps in the process to learn and to continue moving forward. Thank you. I'd like to mention Eric Rice and his book, The Lean Startup, where he mentions, a, The Lean Startup is, is, is a book where Eric Rice describes how technological companies are built. Um, I want to rescue this process that's the, like the, the summary of his book. He says that the process of entrepreneurship or starting a business is building, measuring, learning, building, measuring, and learning again. So what I want you to see here, it's an iterative process. It's not linear, okay? We start, we build, we measure, we learn, and we start again. So basically, you start with an idea, like we just saw ideation, it's the first uh, piece of it. You have an idea for a product or a service, you measure, you go, you talk with clients, you see what they say, what the customer likes, what they don't like, and then you have two choices. You either persevere and you build upon that idea with the new learnings that you have, you build upon your product or service, you test it out with more people, and you learn more and you do it again. Or you can pivot 
and depending on what you learn, maybe your customers didn't like the color of what you were doing, the taste of your product, uh, the value proposition of your service, and you pivot, you take another road in, 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 in the journey, and you build upon a new idea to build a new product or service, measure again, and keep on learning. As you can see again, it's an iterative process, a constant loop. So what's the goal here? To do that learning loop as fast and as constant and, and as cheap as you possibly can. Eric Rice describes it as build, measure, learn, and in Babson we describe it as act, learn, and repeat. So this takes us to the last chapter, that is repeat. The process of doing, doing it again. Shannon already mentioned the importance of embracing failure. Really failure or, or our fear of failure is the single thing that blocks people from taking action. So first we need to break that in, in our mental model, in our mindset, to really pass it to our students. I love this quote, a person who never tried anything new, a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Then, then there is experimentation. This is a, a key aspect of it. Let the students experiment. And I like to explain this to, to young kids with a scientific method because they already see it in school and they already know it and understand it. With a scientific method, you observe something, you have a question, you create a hypothesis, you experiment, you analyze, and then you get to a conclusion. Entrepreneurship is the same thing, only there is no conclusion. You start the process again. So you go out to the world, you observe, or you, you have an, an insight, you have a question, you create a hypothesis or a low fidelity prototype, you test it with customers or you experiment outside in the real world, you analyze the results or measure and you repeat again. Why, what's the importance of the constant loop? What we want to do is to get to a place of systematic learning, to show the students, show, the, show them how to learn. And, and, and once you get this, really there's no failures. It's only a failure if you didn't learn anything in the process. So when you really understand that what you're trying to do is learn again and again and as fast and as cheap as you possibly can, it doesn't matter if you don't make it, if you fail, if you take it into lessons and then you stand up again and you do the process again. We have a, a small break, so we would like to open the floor for Q&A if any of you have some questions about the process that we just talked about. So I, I followed the free economics um, podcasts and they're great. And there's one that, that I recently heard uh, called a good, a good idea is not good enough, right? And it talks about two different styles of carrying out ideas. So on one side is being more of an evolutionary, which is more like doing like right trial and error and for example they talked about uh, the the process of the Sagrada Familia right that it's been constantly changing throughout more than a hundred years or so and then there's like a more of a Picasso kind of which he goes to his place tries out a hundred different ways in which he wants to do a, a painting and then puts it out in the world and it's more of a uh, thinking of, I have to have it more perfect and then throw it out there. I just wanted to think because I, I, I like the idea of the evolutionary part, but how does it, how do you think it agrees or not agrees with the idea that it's always out there about being disruptive, right? And kids are always thinking, I have to do the new great thing and being disruptive. How can you be disruptive and also be evolutionary at the same time, right? I, I don't, it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it, yeah. I just, I just want to, to it, it's, it's a difficult thing to try to be disruptive and evolutionary. I believe disruption is really, really important, but it's not the reality for most people. You know, we, the sexiest stories is the ones that 
there's a co-founder, a technical co-founder that left college and that started a multi-billion dollar business. That's okay, but it's one in seven billion people. That's not the normal path of and having or trying to have disruptive ideas could make that happen. I think I'll, I'll add to that that um, one of the things that we're, we're seeing is with all this technology, companies that are already established are having a really hard time knowing what's their next step and how can they compete with you know, younger people or other people that use technology to, you know, maybe not, they don't necessarily put it out there. I think they go through processes like this where it is evolutionary, it starts, but it ends up being disruptive to a business that has all this, you know, invested in, I don't know, in their, um, you know, all the, the capex that they have in the buildings. And then all of a sudden these people are competing without having to invest in a store and there's no, you know, none of that. And so I think that there's possibility for disruption, but again, you don't, necessarily go out thinking I'm going to be disruptive or I'm going to find that great idea. I think that this is the process that you would start finding and it might be that you end up having one of those great and you don't necessarily go out thinking I'm going to be disruptive or I'm going to find that great idea. I think that this is the process that you would start finding and it might be that you end up having one of those great ideas and you end up being disruptive to some industry but um, you know you don't necessarily know how if that's going to happen or not at the beginning. worked with the uh, young students I, I mean meaning young that you know they are maybe younger than 18 what has been the most attractive when when a kid really understands the concept of affordable loss I think that's one of the best drivers for them to incentivize into action so if you really understand that um, no, you, you don't have to start your big vision and your big project um, and get from point A to point C in one single step, that it's a long way and that you can take many steps with minimum risk so you can continue exploring your idea, your project, or continue exploring if it really is what you want to do. Um, what I've seen with them is that, that when they really grasp the concept of affordable loss, that really kicks them into action. So for me, that's the, the most important piece of it. There's a lot of language you used, you know, Bill, uh, all kinds of observe, uh, question, uh, hypothesis, experiment, learn, build, measure, um, act, build, learn. But it seems that this is, we're, kids, we're born with, with this. Um, and I know it's going to get, we're getting to the part of education, but little kids are, as a parent, as parents, sometimes we try to, we want our kids to be assertive and question and be creative, but also in society we want them to behave or act this way or that way. So do you think this is something that is being stifled? Is that what you're saying? And I mean, the, our education system is stifling this. But it's, not, it's, not, it's nothing new. This is, this is human nature. It's how do we just, I guess, encourage it or let it, let it flourish, going against some of the societal um, norms that we have in, our, in, in Costa Rica and the United States anywhere. I, it's, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I actually love that. I think that you know, hearing you, you make that comment and, and reflecting a little bit on it, it seems like this is actually more of a teaching the schools you know, it's kind of reteaching schools more than it is teaching the students. Because I think it's exactly right. I mean, I think that this is ingrained in kids, it's ingrained in all of us. Um, but, you know, we have to teach schools how to be able to teach this sort of thing and not stifle that creativity. And of course, this doesn't mean, like, like we said at the beginning, you know, it's we also need the, the formal logical thinking is also very important. We need to be able to do both of them. And so the idea is that, you know, by uh, learning how to do some of these things, you can then combine it with some of the other, uh, the content, you know. And so we'll, we'll, the next step and what we'll talk about in the next half of our presentation is we'll go in deeper into the experience that Lincoln School has had applying this methodology to their classrooms. 
and seeing some of their learnings. You know, how does how does this actually work, and what are some of the challenges that we face, and what are some of the things that we've seen? But I think uh, that creativity in in the younger generations and have that coexist with the other type of training that we know so well. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take one more and then we'll go to the break and we'll come back and we'll have more time to, to talk about this. What do you do when a kid finds obstacles beyond their control? Do, they, you, do you say give up? So I think that there will be lots of obstacles and that's kind of one of the biggest pieces of this is train yourself to be in that very uncomfortable situation when you, when you feel like, oh my God, this is a crazy obstacle. And what we've seen, and we'll talk a little bit more with some examples in the next phase, is that um, some of these obstacles that seem unsurmountable, when you tackle them with this methodology, you're, able, you're actually able to persevere. Um, we're gonna be the solution to face those unsurmountable obstacles and realize that they can uh, persevere and that they can go go above them but of course it's one step at a time you know you're not tackling the whole mountain you're tackling the next thing and so it's another thing is how do you teach them to, to break that huge obstacle into smaller pieces that they can actually tackle if you add anything also to add on that um, the, the, um, the aspect of training kids for them to have motivation and perseverance and for them to be able to go inside themselves and find that motivation and perseverance can go go above them but of course it's one step at a time you know you're not tackling the whole mountain you're tackling the next thing and so it's another thing is how do you teach them to, to break that huge obstacle into smaller pieces that they can actually tackle. If you add anything. Also to add on that, um, the, the, um, the aspect of training kids for them to have motivation and perseverance and for them to be able to go inside themselves and find that motivation and perseverance can, can help them go and, 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 and fight those big tackles that they have. And if it's an on, on a very big challenge that they cannot do anything about it, for them to understand that they can't do anything about it, and they need to understand what they have, the resources they have in their hand right now, and how they can take action from their shoes to go out there and, and solve those challenges. So why don't we take a break now? There is um, some coffee, thank you. The Centro Cultural for that. And um, we'll be back in 10 or 15 minutes and we'll look at the specifics of this experience and we'll dive deeper into what this means. Thank you. This is, this part that we're coming to is my favorite part. So I want to make sure that we have time for, for you guys to ask questions as well. So what we are going to go into now is explaining a little bit about the experience that we've had bringing this methodology that you've heard about and learned a little bit about to, to Lincoln School. Um, so as we mentioned, um, this methodology developed in Babson has been taken uh, by Lincoln School to develop entrepreneurial thinking and action in their students. It has been prioritized by the board so this is the, the objective that it's fulfilling, the strategic objective for Lincoln School, to foster a mindset and shared culture of entrepreneurial education that is responsive to global challenges. And this is how uh, Lincoln sees it. It's a priority for the board of directors. It's a priority for the whole school. Um, and I think that part of the reason that we've been able to push this and are here sharing about this is that Lincoln has a very unique ownership structure and the fact that it's owned by the parents and that it doesn't have a profit motive um, also is one of the reasons that it's actually out there wanting to share this methodology with other schools in Costa Rica, with other countries uh, in Central America and actually beyond. And um, Babson is using Lincoln kind of as, an, uh, as a laboratory and learning from this experience as well and then sharing this uh, more broadly. Now, at Lincoln, they have trained already, they've trained 100% of their teachers to apply this methodology in the school at all levels, from pre-kinder, and we have one of the pre-kinder teachers here as well, 
all the way through 12th grade and in all subject areas. So it's taught inside the classroom, it's taught, uh, it's part of the sports curriculum, it's part of the arts, the service, it's, it's everywhere. And it's also something that's dealt with not just with the students and the teachers and inside the school, but also outside when we think about how we talk to the parents and how we are able to, to bring this cultural change outside of the school as well. So they're promoting um, entrepreneurship of all kinds and they are seeking to really teach uh, and develop these entrepreneurial practices and habits um, so that the students can test ideas, fail, iterate, improve, and then turn these ideas into reality and impacting our world. Now I want to mention we have Lincoln representatives here as I mentioned. We have Mr. Rinaldo who's the general director of Lincoln and we have Mr. Scott Guerin who is the academic Director at Lincoln, we have Iris Prada, who has been leading this partnership with Babson and a lot of this effort. We had a board member before, but I think I wanted to mention that because if you if they you have questions, you can feel free to talk to them because they they're very happy to share uh, these experiences with all of you. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on these key learnings, and these are. You know, when Daniel and I were talking, these are our, our, what we think are the key learnings. There might be, I'm sure there are many others. We wanted to share these ones as uh, the key ones that I, we think are very applicable. So we'll start with project-based learning, um, which is core. It's how we are able to apply this thinking in the classrooms. It's through uh, PBL. We will then look at some specific teaching techniques. So how do we actually incorporate this into the classroom? And I think that can be really interesting for you as well because it's about a different way of teaching. And that's how this starts, is teaching in a different way. And so we'll, we'll look at what some of those techniques are. And then we'll finish with assessment, which is a pervasive piece of education. And it's also very important to look at, at what assessment does and how it plays with or against what we are trying to achieve with, with this entrepreneurial thinking. So for uh, PBL, we, I, I'm actually going to let um, Mr. Holman tell you about this directly. And we'll see if I can make this work. Let's see. My name is Michael Holman, and I am the middle school principal at Lincoln School. My name is Deborah Dupree, and I teach sixth grade science. Project-based learning is basically founded on the premise that you start with sort of a problem. Sometimes they also call it problem-based learning. Um, so you pose a specific problem to a group of students and sort of make, give it the project relevance, make it real world. Um, so that way the students can tackle and investigate and they can sort of become the drivers in the unit. Instead of just getting a lesson and like here, read the textbook, do the lesson, and answer these questions, the students are given some sort of driving challenge or problem to fix that's real world. It's, it's authentic. And as they're finding out about this problem that really does exist, it kind of it leaves the classroom and it gets them really connecting to what's going on in the world and it gives them a sense of purpose and it makes them want to learn more about the problem so that they can feel like they can truly solve it. Allowing our students to see the relevance in what they're doing and making the learning meaningful is going to allow us to do much more for them than sort of sticking to the, the script of sticking to math and science and social studies, but allowing them to see how those subject areas connect to the real world and giving them those soft skills so they can actually have an impact on that world as well is going to much better prepare our students for, for the future. Entrepreneurship sort of provides us with a framework um, of the skills and the attitudes and the beliefs that we want to see in our students so they can actually go out and live our mission. They started doing things on their own. They connected with a group, Arbol de Esperanza, on their own. They went out and met with the organization on their own and they made arrangements themselves to like set up a booth to sell things, to try to raise money for this organization. So this was still when we were in the first steps of the project. Like we, we hadn't even gotten to those parts yet, but they were already so instantly engaged and instantly passionate 
about what they were doing, that they've scheduled meetings with principals, they've scheduled meetings with teachers, they've made business plans, they've talked about their overarching goal. The most powerful, impactful example of this project sort of being successful or the most impactful thing to me has been seeing a number of specific groups really go above and beyond of what we were expecting them to do and doing things that we've never had sixth graders do before. I see sixth graders who are taking trips to San Ramon to help an organization. Students who are organizing a field trip to La Paz, the Universidad de La Paz. Students who are thinking about how we can redesign applications like Uber Eats so that way some of that money can be donated to food shelves. So students are coming up with ideas that we probably could have never imagined or thought of and just seeing how these students are three steps ahead of us with this process has really, really motivated me. So we're already seeing as young as sixth grade students who are willing, interested, and motivated to go out and make a difference in the world. So when you walk into the Lincoln campus, this is what you see everywhere. This is in the hallways, this is inside the classrooms, this comes home as homework uh, to the parents, this is part of their assignments, and th these are the sustainable development goals, and it's part of every conversation. So they're aware of what are the problems as society, as you know, human beings that we are called to solve, and this becomes the root of all of the work that they're doing and the, the source uh, from where the, the project-based learning uh, stems from. Another tool um, that I want to share is this one, because the SDGs, and I'll go back, the Sustainable Development Goals are very broad. And it's great because it, it allows students to see what is their interest. And there's lots of things that can capture their interest. And there's lots of need for them to come in and see how they can help to solve. But there are also tools that can help us go even more granularly. And I want to share this with you. This is uh, the Social Progress Index. Costa Rica. Let's see. Here we go. Costa Rica is very lucky because we have the social progress index is measured for every single canton, for the 81 cantones in Costa Rica, we have this measurement. And we can see, you know, which are the cantones that are in red, they're the ones that are having, they have less social progress, the ones that are in green have higher social progress. And you can look to see, for example, if we wanted to find out Monte de Oca, which is where we are currently, Oh, I clicked Cartago. Oops. There you go. There we go. We can see which areas we are doing better in, these green ones. So we're doing better in access to higher education, tolerance and inclusion, access to information and communication, but doing worse in personal safety, access to basic knowledge and health and wellness. And we have all these details you can see that Montes de Oca is the 35th out of the 81 cantones. So we're in the, the, the top half. But if we compare ourselves with other cantones that have a similar per capita income, we can see which are those areas that need the most work and which are those pain points that we have. And so tools like these can help you, can help students, can help any of us really understand what are the needs that are being experienced by different, uh, in different areas. And then this is just a starting point. Then you, then you go in and then you talk and then you, you get um, a better sense directly from people that live there. But this is, this is a, a starting point. And these are the tools that we have to work with. I want to share with you another example. And we saw in the video how when you start with that problem as the beginning, and that's what gives the kids the motivation, and that's what spurs the learning and how powerful that is, you can really have incredible outcomes that you, you didn't even think about. And I want to share this other example, which I really like, um, which is Compartamos la Mesa. 
This is a project that two Lincoln students started, and it, and it speaks to objective number two, SDG number two, about hunger, um, where they saw that at school, and then researching, they saw that everywhere, in hotels and in restaurants, they, these, these uh, businesses and uh, organizations throw away tons of food that's in perfectly good condition when there's lots of people that are hungry in Costa Rica. And so how could this be? And so they looked into the problem and they took small steps and they talked to different people and they, they find out that one of the key challenges is that in Costa Rica the law uh, leaves the organizations that donate food, leaves them vulnerable to lawsuits if there is any problem with the food that's donated at the end point where it's uh, consumed. So even if it's in perfect condition where it goes out, if there's any problem with it at the very end, then they are the ones that are liable. And so they started a whole a bunch of work uh, that ended in them, or actually it hasn't ended, but one of the, the big milestones was presenting this Proyecto de Ley in la Asamblea Legislativa uh, to change how this works and to let allow these, basically changing the law so that these organizations could donate that food, uh, being able to contribute to the social progress of their communities uh, without facing these liabilities and without facing the possibility of lawsuits. So these are examples of things that students are doing that are having an incredible, incredible impact. And it's the, an example of how um, when you allow them to be creative, to use you know, all their motivation and to, to use their resources, whatever they have in hand, these are the types of things that they are able to do. So we'll go now on to the, the second part. Do you have any questions about this? We'll go on to the second part now about uh, what we do inside the classroom. Okay. If, if anyone has a question about the projects that Shannon just mentioned, I think are really key examples of what the school is doing, what the students are doing in the real world. So if anyone wants to interrupt me, please go ahead. Just uh, raise your hand. So as we mentioned before, entrepreneurial thinking is a mindset, a way of thinking. So being a way of thinking, it's not specific knowledge that we want to give our students. When you distill the true essence of entrepreneurship, you get this soft skills or essential skills that Shannon was talking about. So being soft skills or, or essential skills, it becomes more important how you teach this than what you teach. So again, it's, you're not gonna pass business creation knowledge directly to the student, but you're giving them a framework for them to think entrepreneurially. This is based on research done by uh, Babson professors. Um, this is based on a book by Heidi Neck. It's one of the most respected uh, persons in this planet regarding entrepreneurial education. And she states that when you teach entrepreneurship, it, entrepreneurship is a, is a practice. So we need to practice it to really develop the mindset. And it's a practice of these five things. It's a practice of play, it's a, pla a practice of empathy, a practice of creation, a practice of experimentation, and most importantly, a practice of reflection. First, the practice of play. We need to understand the difference between a game and playing. You know, if we give a student a game, it has really, um, a really structured way and rules, and it has a, a, an ending. And what we refer to as play is giving the student a structure inside the classroom for them to be a little bit more free or to do more experimentation and, and creativity challenges. So it needs to be fun. Why? Because this stimulates creativity. It makes it more engaging for the student and it's always practice-based. Really important piece of it, not only the kids need to have more fun, the teachers need to have more fun as well. And once we practice this um, practice of playing, we get used to having this um, less structured ways in our classrooms and it becomes more engaging for, for both 
uh, stakeholders in the classroom. Then the practice of empathy. Empathy is one of, of the cornerstones of really getting for, uh, the students to think entrepreneurially. Empathy gives us the tools to better understand what entrepreneurship is. When you can go to the world and connect with other people, you can understand uh, better their problems. So it's one of the best tools to find and solve problems. When you go ahead and you put yourself in, in your customer's shoes or your community's shoes, And it ties a lot with design thinking, that it's another really important um, piece that we, that we incentivize at Lincoln. Here I, me I mentioned three really um, um, leaders in design thinking studies. The first one is IDEO. IDEO is the top design firm in, in the planet, I believe. And they say that design thinking is inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Again, it's a constant loop. The Design School of Stanford says that first you empathize, then you define a problem, you ideate a solution for that problem, you prototype with as fast and as cheap as you possibly can, and you test, and then you start again. And Dev Patnaik says empathize, create, and test. So as you can see, when you talk about design thinking, you're talking the, about entrepreneurial thought and action as well. It's just different names that we have for different things, but what I want to focus here is that it's the same iterative process, it's the same circular process that never stops. Then there is the practice of creation. When you go and you build something new, you create something from scratch that stimulates creativity. Also, we do a lot of ideation. Ideation is just a, a name, something that we uh, use it as vocabulary. Basically, it is brainstorming, but based on volume. So what do we want to do? Is when, when a teacher gives us a, a, a project and we, we have to ideate something or brainstorm on the solution that we want to provide, we focus on, on ideation instead of brainstorming just because ideation focuses on volume. As we saw before, the only secure way to really get good ideas is to have lots of ideas. There is barriers to creativity that Shannon already mentioned before, and these are the barriers that we need to really break in our students for them to, to realize their full potential in their creative side. First one is the fear of failure. Second is no appetite for chaos. We like things really a, in an orderly fashion, really structured. There's always a preference of judging over generating ideas. And I think in, in our society in Costa Rica, that the, the, the culture of chota is really, you can see it in every day. It's way easier to tell someone, hey, that's not gonna work, no, you will never be able to do that, than going out there and saying, hey, how can I help you for this to, to become a reality? Then there is a, a dislike for incubating ideas. People love having new ideas and, and, and getting that, um, that aspect of people telling you, hey, that's a great idea, but people don't like to incubate ideas. Why? Because it takes a, a lot of work. Entrepreneurship is really, really hard. Anything new you're gonna do or build, it takes a lot of input of your work, a lot of extra hours of work, and that's why people don't like incubating ideas. And also a perceived lack of challenge. Um, it's not challenging enough, it's not engaging enough, so as a student, why would I want to do this? Again, fear of failure, that is the most significant roadblock because of two things. First, it stops, stops us from creating new ideas. Okay, this is the risk of making a mistake. We don't want to like, expose ourselves that we are wrong, so we prefer not to, to take any new steps. And then there is the process of sharing your ideas and the fear of social failure that we need to break inside our homes, inside our classrooms, communities, and we 
tend to do this a lot. And if you really open your eyes to how you um, manage other people's failures, you're going to see that we as a society um, tend, tend to incentivize the, the fear of social failure again and again. So helping students to develop a practice of creation. First is cognitive theory. You can tell the student how creation works. That's, that's one, one way that you can go. The other one is problem solving and expertise-based theory of cre creativity. This is really tied up to what Shannon just mentioned of PBL, project-based learning. I'm going to explain it in the next slides. And then problem finding theory and design thinking. You don't know what the problem is, so you go to a community and you use design thinking strategies to empathize with the community, see the problems that they're having, and coming up with new solutions to their problems. Teacher creation as a practice, we as teachers versus the way we teach. Then another really important step, and I believe Lincoln is going to be a, a leader in this in the upcoming years, is the environment. How do we manage the classroom? And most of all, our behavior. Are we giving a lecture and are we going to give our back to the students and write in a wall for two hours? They're going to all sleep or go into their cell phones. It's not going to be engaging. Um, so that's another really important part of it. Then we have the practice of experimenting, actively experimenting in hands-on projects. We do this to incentivize the students to learn by doing, learn by doing in, in an in, interactive and iterative process of going outside the classroom and exper experimenting. You saw it in the examples. You saw it in the examples that the, the, the kids started with a problem and they went out of their way, out of the classroom, out of the school to understand the communities and to come up with new ideas or new solutions that they could do. They could take action to help um, solve or, or understand that problem. Then again, the essence of experimentation, you develop a hypothesis, you test, you measure, and you build on results. The same thing that we saw the scientific method only it goes back again. It's a circular process it, that you go over and over again. And in, in here, in the, in the practice of experimentation, our role as teachers is to create experiences that provide these learning opportunities for the kids. So the more we are invisible, the deeper the learning the kids are going to have. So again, we have three theoretical approaches. The first one is problem-based learning. As Shannon mentioned, we give a framework of problems to the students. We give the, uh, the global sustainable development goals, and they choose one of the problems. So for example, you saw a, a group with a student named Mariana. She was giving um, refrescos and, 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 and food in a in a comedor in Pavas, she chose no hunger. Problem number two in the goals. So that's what the teacher gave her, and then she started doing research based on that problem and finding new solutions. What can she do to do this? Uh, she inspired herself in other students inside the school that had worked in this Proyecto de Ley that's really important. She went out of, her, out of her way to make contact with an organization, Este Comedor Infantil, and she started putting everything into action. Then, then there's evidence-based learning, where you give evidence based on expertise or, or past experiences from professionals, and you can build or experiment upon that. And sense-making, you have a, a bunch of data, and you work from that data to go out and do a new experiment. Concept testing, we talked about the Lean Startup, about low fidelity prototyping. This is all about taking action experimenting we need the students to get out of the of the classroom and experiment then there is the practice of reflection this is the most important piece of it and i think it's 
uh, the most difficult because we are not used to re reflect. You know, this world is constantly going. It's every day is faster. Uh, we have a lot of input. And we as grown-ups don't pause the button and stop and think. And w this is what we're asking our students to do. And it's one of the most difficult processes. So the, the basis of this is to experience thi things in order to better understand them. When a student reflects upon a problem, that's when you get deep learning. The systematic learning that we're talking about, that's the, the repeat process of entrepreneurial thought and action. This is what we want for the students to take a pause in their day and really understand the lessons that they're getting from, from the experimentation or the creation, the playing and the empathy that they were doing around the project. It's not intuitive, so we need to guide uh, the students in order for them to become disciplined uh, reflectors and we, do, we need to do it ourselves as well and it is re really the most difficult thing we are ask our students to do pause and think then teaching reflection it gives the student more responsibility to learn again the more invisible we are as teachers the better the deeper the lesson that they're gonna have and Obviously, reflecting upon the problems you're trying to solve, it keeps entrepreneurship personal. So it makes it uh, more personal and, and less for you to, to stop what you're doing and, and, and get the project and don't do it anymore. If you have a question around uh, teaching. Gracias. With this, this last one on reflection, one of the, the activities that I loved recently was when my first grader, uh, when they invited me to my fir the first grade classroom so that we could have, instead of the teachers telling us how our students had done, we had student-led conferences. So it was our students, my daughter, my seven-year-old daughter, telling me, reflecting on how she had done over the course of the semester or whatever it was, that, and, and telling me what her goals were for the next you know, the next period and how she had done. So I think that that reflection is difficult and it's very important that we do it. So we'll go now into the assessment piece. And this is a very important one because it's, as I was mentioning before, it's pervasive and we're very used to doing it in a certain way and it can help or detract from we're trying, what we're trying to encourage. So I'm gonna ask you, we're going to do a little uh, experiment, and I, I thank Mr. Guerin for, for the idea for doing this. I'm going to ask you now to, to grade my handwriting. So you tell me how you think I'm doing. I'm writing my name here. What do you, thank you. <laughs> what do you think? What would you give me? A zero? A zero? <laughs> OK. OK. Great. I'm trying. <laughs> How would you grade this handwriting? I mean, I don't know if we have zeros. If we, if we did it with grades, I'd probably be like, like a C or a D. I don't know what you have, like a C. A C minus, maybe? All right. I'll try again. I'll try again. <laughs> Give me a moment. Is that a little better? Is that a little better? Uh, C, C plus maybe? <laughs> a little better, right? All right, I'll give, me a, I'll give myself a C plus. All right, okay, I'll try again. Thank you. That's that's the practice there. All right. What about now? An A? Oh, I heard an A. I'm going to give myself an A for that. So, so how do I do? How did I do in your handwriting course? What grade do I get in the course? So you got a C at the beginning, a C plus, 
So this probably still averages out to like, I don't know, a B minus if I'm being, you know, depending on what the, you know, what, how we're, how we're actually doing it. But this is actually extremely discouraging to me because I can write my name and I can do it again. I can do it consistently. So this average grade that you're giving me is not really capturing what I'm actually able to do at the end of the course. And, and this is kind of how grades really are. You know, it's really tough when you're, you know, you're learning something new. You get a bad grade, you made a mistake. You can do great later on and you can get an A, but you're still not going to get a good grade in that course because averages never fully reflect um, where you are. It's always going to be an average. So it's always going to be uh, a misrepresentation of where you actually are at the end of the course. So if you, you, know, if you just look at, at this part and you see this, I can do this consistently, but it's not being reflected uh, in my grade. And actually, you know, you, you did notice I was writing this with my left hand, right? So that's kind of cool. You know, maybe I broke my arm or maybe I'm just practicing something else. And Getting this B is disincentivizing me from doing that. So if I know that this is going to be my grade, and I know that you like seeing it in just in print or just in cursive, I'm going to do that so that I can get that A. I'm going to coast with whatever I know works, and I'm not going to try anything that might be risky or anything that you might not like or anything that you haven't told me. I'm going to look for exactly what it is you're looking for so that I can get that A from the beginning. So this way of grading is actually damaging to what, we, what we're trying to, to achieve. So a better way of grading, and this is something that Lincoln's trying to, to do, is what we're calling, what they call best fit grading, or it's also called real-time grading. And it's basically the idea that um, you evaluate students as they learn, and the grade that they get is the grade that reflects where they are currently in that learning process. And it's, you know, based, you know, how it compares to the expectations, but it's what they've actually achieved, you know? So it doesn't matter if I made a mistake at the beginning. If I have learned, and, and, and actually, you know, we realize that making that mistake is part of what's going to help you learn what you, whatever it is that you're doing. So we're not going to penalize you for making those mistakes. And we're not going to penalize you for, for going through a learning process. It's actually part of that learning. So you, by doing best fit grades or, um, or that real-time grade, we are able to encourage that risk taking and we're able to accurately describe where the student is in the learning. Now this is very difficult to actually uh, be able to do this. It takes a huge amount of change, not just in the teachers, but also for the parents and for the community. You, know, you go to, your, to your, your parents and they don't know, you know, what exactly are you telling me about, about my student? Or you, you, know, you graduate with a grade that's not an 80 or a 75, it's, you know, it's different. And you know, then you're applying for colleges in the US or here in Costa Rica and they don't know what that means. And so it's, it takes a lot of effort. But you cannot say that you're going to incentivize creativity in a school and maintain this type of grading, which is disincentivizing it completely. So if, you're, if you really want to focus on, on, on really creating these spaces for students, then you have to be able to change the way that you're grading so that you allow for that risk taking and you allow for, them, for students to make mistakes and to learn from them. Do you have any questions about this? I'm, Mr. Gannon, they, they can explain it much better, I'm sure, but you have any questions about the assessment piece? Okay. We can talk more about it as well later. Okay. So, what we want to do is give or share this knowledge with every single school in this country and give every single kid that gets to be born in this country the opportunity to realize their full potential as creative problem solvers. It is with deep gratitude and an honor to tell you that this is the future we are already building. We have created a public private alliance between Fundación Omar Dengo, Baclodomatic, 
AED EY, yo emprendedor al Ministerio de Educación Pública, and we've been creating content for more than 11,000 students in 130 rural high schools of Costa Rica to incentivize this kind of thinking. It's the first steps uh, in what we need to do, but it, uh, we're making steps in the right direction, and I believe we have a lot of things that we need to do more to get this kind of mindset inside every single educational institution in this country. Great. So we're gonna introduce one um, more uh, key idea. And it's when we talk about um, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, we always hear about STEM and the importance of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the reason is that these subjects are very important to go from idea to something tangible that, that's real and that you can touch. So this is very important for, for that process. But what we would like you to understand is that what is critical is not that we try to graduate more and more engineers or nanotechnologists or computer scientists, but what we actually need is to bring the STEM subjects and integrate them into all of the careers. So our criminologists need to learn about cybersecurity, and our agronomists need to learn how to use drones. And it's really this combination, the knowledge of these subjects with the experience in entrepreneurial thinking and action that will allow our young people to really take advantage of technology and to apply technology creatively to any area of expertise, any problem that they want to solve. So it's really, it's that combination that's critical. So now we want to challenge you. To challenge you to apply this from now on. Teach your students and other young people that failure is a critical part, critical component of success, and that they shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. The next time that you get a new group of students and you're doing introductions, ask them to share their greatest failure and their greatest learning. Support your students or your children when they tell you that they have an idea that they want to experiment with. And remember the phrase, fail often so that you can succeed sooner. What will be your first step? Thank you. <laughs> We still have six minutes. If you have any questions or comments, we'd be happy to, to take them. I want to say that one of the reasons why we're so passionate with this methodology is that um, schools are going to find out that they've been doing many of these elements ever since. You just need to, you know, put them together. But also that the methodology fits across ages. So all of a sudden, you know, the way you're playing with your kids or grandchildren to, you know, co-create together, you're applying the circular methodology and then, you know, you start having conversations about how you want to plan some of your family personal goals and, and you're using the same methodology. So we wonder if this is the way we've always learned throughout history and maybe schools brought us down in some ways. You know, that I would say, you know, has been my experience here trying this, you know, across ages. Great. In this part that you were saying about the theoretical resources, that you say sense making, what is sense making? The author says that sense making is when you experiment based on other, other people's data. So what you mentioned about evidence based as well, is for example, um, Darwin's theory of relativity. He already has evidence to prove a concept and you can experiment based on those knowledges that other human beings have gathered in, throughout the history of the world. Mm 
Good afternoon. Um, like to go further in this um, way of thinking or methodology, is there any sort of certification in Costa Rica that we can, I mean, go and maybe be trained or something like that? Um, maybe, maybe we can have a Babson Lincoln certification <laughs> soon for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's more and more in Costa Rica where we're seeing that um, this is being uh, strengthened, entrepreneurship is being strengthened, and you see, you know, competitions happening, and you see universities starting to tackle it. But it's, it's, it can be very tricky because often the universities will look at entrepreneurship from a very theoretical perspective, and they still haven't been able to change and, um, and do that. That, that switch, you know. So I don't know of specific programs to recommend, uh, but I do know that part of what we're doing is bringing Babson in closer, and uh, we want to, to be able to share a lot of that knowledge and create some of these spaces as well for, um, you know, for training and, and helping to train. I don't know if any, does anybody know of good programs to, to share? Did you know? I'm not, I'm not bad. Pasa el micrófono para que quede grabado. Gracias. Um, that is a question that, you know, the way we we go through teacher education, colleges and universities, the accreditation process is very very important, but when you start thinking that you're going to do certain things in your professional life only if you're accredited, you're narrowing and it goes against what we're, you know, we're saying. Yes. Um, so yeah, hopefully, you know, one day this is something that Ministerio de Educación, who, you know, we're connecting with can find, you know, the answer to that. Um, the other important thing here is that there's no excuse for not having the right resources because the fewer resources you have the more creative you're going to be so something very interesting that started happening you know in some of the classrooms and also you know we're doing this at home is that kids start putting their plastic games away you know the fisher prize and others legos of course you know they want to keep and then all of a sudden you know a uh, um, carton old carton of milk becomes into the you know prototype that they want to build and and so on so take the risk you know and one of the things that this methodology says because it's been taught over 3000 um students around the world and and they've been um, asked to establish these kind of of centers around the world also it's because you really learn to think that you can take small great steps just with the resources that you have at hand so you know the idea here is that developing an entrepreneurial mindset it's a great way to close gaps and also, you know, we want to see this done in a very democratic way. Resources won't limit you. Just to add on that, I think the, the need that he just surfaced, I think could be a, a, going back into what we just talked about, it could be a really easy example for us at Lincoln and with John Prendedor, test to create a certification for other teachers out, outside Lincoln. Um, what we've done at Lincoln, teachers have become really good at teaching other teachers inside, and I think um, leveraging that to spread it out could be uh, maybe a next step. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps also even, uh, perhaps not a certification, I think a step towards that is sharing, you know? So, you know, even here, you could start implementing it in a classroom and share it with other teachers and share it with students, you know, with teachers outside. And I think that starts creating uh, the environment that's rich uh, for that learning. And that is my question. Like, how did you go about training the teachers at Lincoln School and what challenges did you face? That's a great question. I'll let the, the trainers speak to, <laughs> to that question. I don't know. I, I think we're really... Um, lucky to have the teachers we have at Lincoln. Uh, they really have committed to this decision from 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 the board of directors, and we've seen incredible things, and we've we've learned incredible things. Uh, there was just a spark 
of knowledge that Babson brought to Costa Rica and the real value have been in the teachers going through that, um, that skill set that Babson brought, but then sharing all these skill sets and, and methodologies between them. Yeah. I'd also like to say that um, as teachers and administrators, our students show, were showing us the way as well. You know, we, they, were, they were doing, developing authentic, purposeful projects outside of what we were doing in the classroom, which led us to think, well, this is what we need to do in the classroom. This is year, several years ago. So we started, we started to, students, this is the way they want to learn, I believe, and that they've shown us the way. So we're still in the process. We've, you know, Mr. Guerin and, and we've been, and, and Daniel, with the help of Daniel, it's constant. And we're st we have teachers sitting here who have been trained and they know that that's our focus. And little by little, we're changing the, uh, our methodology, which is not always easy. It's a process, though. And we're getting there. We've had great support from Babson um, College, who have sent representatives from the Lewis Institute, and they will send. In a, well, within a couple of weeks, we'll have another visit. So it's little by little, but I think it's a lot has to do with our students and their desire to make learning purposeful. Yeah, I, I'd say that also. You know, it it is pressure from a lot of sides. It's not easy to change, you know, and, it's, and, and teaching is not easy to start with. And so I think that it is that pressure from the students. We see it as a board level as well, and it's all coming together. And it's also finding champions, because there are some teachers that weren't necessarily on board at the beginning. So we found that the younger, the younger teachers, and that's why the, the preschool has been so important for this whole process for the whole school, because we found that a lot of the teachers the younger teachers in the preschool level were able to understand this and show what it meant to, to other teachers that perhaps were more ingrained in a certain way of teaching. Uh, but it's been, there's also been recruiting specifically with that purpose in mind. So it's a lot of these things coming together to the point now that it's gone from being specific examples of things that are working to it also being involved, in the, it's being immersed in the curriculum. So the curriculum is being rewritten around this as well. So it's now being structurally embedded into, into everything that, that we're doing. Sharon, can I say two other things? Um, as you know, we're explaining at the beginning, this is an open methodology and an invitation to all schools, local, uh, public and, and private in, in the country. That's the way the you know, alliance is, is being built. And we are growing the network within the teaching ecosystem, right? Because there is an entrepreneurial ecosystem, but we want to grow you know, the teaching ecosystem. So we're, we're recruiting retired teachers like me. I'm retired. <laughs> I'm over the hill. <laughs> so I'm hoping you know, to bring people you know, uh, similar to my age. As uh, she said, um, our preschool teachers, some who are here, were the first one to understand this. We had great positive experience three years ago putting together Together, you know, a pilot program for our students to to start, you know, creating um, is the, uh, ventures with, you know, Blue Valley Pan Am School uh, last year with, you know, the Golden Valley, and also people outside the field of teaching. Because when you bring an engineer into the class, or you bring, you know, a, a, a biologist or a medical doctor or somebody else, like a student said, isn't this the way, you know, God created us? It seems like this is the way we all learn. We just go, you know, into our own specific fields and some things are more important than, than the other. So this is, you know, open to everybody and either, you know, through Lincoln School directly or through Joint Prendedor, you know, we will be growing the, the network of people who want to be trainer of trainers. And also, you know, it's important to understand that we're doing this in a very democratic way. There won't be, you know, payment involved. So, you know, you have to come to, to this with, you know, uh, an open heart. We're not going to pay you to be trained. We're just going to transmit our, lo is the, our knowledge and probably won't be paid to train others, right? And maybe one day, yes, I don't know. But right now, the way this is working, you know, in order to, to, to make this a very democratic process, the people that are doing this are doing it for, for free, just, you know, to develop that uh, mindset. And one of the reasons why we um, are working uh, closely with the uh, private sector alongside the Ministry of Education is because the Ministry of Education can't do it alone. And also the employability comes 
not just you know from the public sector but from the private sector and the private sector has extended their hands so certainly you know with uh, Yo Emprendedor would be a, a great way to to connect with this I just want to add to answer your question uh, the importance of of leadership you have here three leaders at the school that go to the to the teachers and incentivize them to fail and incentivize them to go out to the class and try new things and test and measure results and change the way they're assessing and come up with new knowledge, learn, fail, see what they learned and test again, come up with new, uh, with new prototypings in classrooms and come up again with new knowledge. So leadership really incentivizing this kind of entrepreneurial thinking in the, the teacher body I, I would say that that's one of the most important aspects of it. We're a few minutes over, but I, I just wanted to add one, one more um, comment, which is that when we, when we talked about STEM and we talk about entrepreneurship, you, you think of those courses, but really uh, we have found that when in this search for, for this, entre you know, embedding this entrepreneurial thinking, the language courses and the language teachers are some of our best allies, and they become some of the best allies for the students because uh, those language courses are some of, that's when you can start developing, you know, you, the business plan or the communication plan and, and you can actually take advantage of those language courses to go in depth into some of the, the areas that need to be developed. And I think that, you know, without knowing exactly, you know, all the, the details of how the Centro Cultural works and, and, and exactly how, how, you know, how the students uh, come here, it seems that this is a great opportunity for partnership as well. You know, and you can re I can imagine, for example, bringing together students that are uh, in El Tech, for example, and they have certain capacities with students that are you know, taking an English course here and bringing them together and seeing what can come out of this thinking and bringing students with these different uh, capabilities together around a common problem that they want to solve. So I think that, um, you know, the what you're looking at in the classroom and, and the specific subject that you're focusing on doesn't matter. The, the, the thing is, you know, opening yourself up to what this type of learning and this type of teaching can do and, and opening up the opportunities for your students to see what they can come up with and partnering around all of these things. And I think that it, there's lots and lots of potential for, for great things to, to come out of it. So I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, it's really been a pleasure to, to share all of this with you, and I hope that, that you'll think of that question that was up there, what's your first step? And please let us know if we can help with anything from Lincoln, speaking from Lincoln and from our behalf as well. We'd be happy to help.